All right, this is our last lecture for week three, and uh, we're going to finish up talking about worldview. Obviously, as I mentioned, you're not going to be reading your textbook on worldview until next week, but next week we also introduce the unit of theology to you with your assignment dealing with the statement of faith. So I've got a series of lectures on theology for next week, so we had to do worldview just a little bit before you started your reading. Shouldn't be a problem for you, I don't suspect. So anyway, here we go with that. I'm just going to give you one more here. We can't fit in every worldview, uh, not in the time uh, restraints that we have. And so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of a few other worldviews uh, that are prominent in history and in the world. Uh, we've talked about Christian theism. We've talked about deism. Okay, so we're going to pick up and we're going to talk about naturalism. The first two worldviews we talked about believed in God. There was a sort of a foundational uh, belief in God. And uh, obviously two different, very uh, different worldviews, Christian theism and deism, but nonetheless still believed in the God. Now naturalism picks up, uh, it's atheistic in its foundation, okay? Let me just talk to you about uh, naturalism for just a minute. It's one of the few uh, other worldviews that we're going to talk about in this final lecture. Naturalism is the philosophical belief that everything arises from natural properties and causes, and supernatural or spiritual explanations are excluded or discounted. Okay, you can see how you couldn't believe in God and hold to naturalism as your worldview. Uh, so, what are some assumptions that uh, we see uh, associated with naturalism? Uh, matter one, matter matter <laughs> exists eternally and is all that there is. There is no God. The physical world is it. That's what we have. That's all that there is. Uh, two, the cosmos exists as a closed system. Okay, held together as it were from within. Since you don't believe in a God and the physical world is all there is, there's nothing transcendent uh, beyond that. Uh, it's a closed system. Okay, Death, what it means to die is to cease to exist. Okay, And also, and finally, ethics related solely, or ethics rather, is related solely to human consciousness. Okay, Ethics then is not derived from the nature of things. It is not grounded in anything outside of humanity itself. I mean, think about it. If there is no God that transcends physical creation, then what is morality? What is ethics? It's just whatever we decide that it is, okay? Whatever we have naturally uh, decided it is based on the good for society and so on and so forth. And so ethics is solely related to human consciousness. So those are some features related to naturalism. And so very often when you uh, come across an atheist or you hear an atheist debating a Christian theist in a public forum, uh, it's not uncommon that they are holding to a naturalistic worldview. Okay, This is a very common worldview for an atheist to hold. Uh, there's another kind of uh, worldview out there uh, that would imply atheism. It's called nihilism. Okay, What is nihilism? It's the rejection of all religious and moral principles, often in the belief that life is meaningless, or belief that nothing in the world has real existence. And um, this doesn't sound very good, does it? It sounds a little, uh, it lacks a little bit of hope, it seems to me. But it's, uh, it is true, or it's a logical conclusion. Uh, if you start with naturalism, uh, it can very easily lead to nihilism. These are some logical conclusions that you can come to. And so some uh, folks that have started off as naturalists uh, morph into more of a, na a nihilistic worldview. Okay. What are some features? Well, actually, rather than that, what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that I think this is untenable. In other words, we can't really do this. This is not a worldview that really works. And I'm going to say that for a few reasons. What are some reasons? One, uh, such a view, nihilism, renders moral action impossible. Okay, No action or any action is acceptable in any situation if you break this down and reduce it to its logical conclusion. Uh, for any nihilist to think and for that reason, I would say it's untenable. Uh, also, for any nihilist to think or to trust one's own thought is to live inconsistent with one's worldview. Uh, just because you think that this is wrong or right or good or bad or whatever, uh, we can't help but think this way. And when we do, we're living inconsistent with a nihilistic worldview. Okay? What's another reason this is untenable? People cannot live with a thoroughgoing nihilism because it violates the universal need that we have as humans to have meaning and significance. And so that's why Nietzsche, the great philosopher, ended up in an asylum and Hemingway, the great American novelist, committed suicide, some have suggested. And uh, these were examples of nihilists, okay? And so anyway, nihilism, sort of a logical conclusion for naturalism, though not every naturalist 
not even most naturalists, uh, end up there. But it is a worldview that exists and uh, sort of launches from naturalism. Okay, uh, what's another worldview that uh, we could discuss and kind of think about that's different from Christian theism or deism or now naturalism or nihilism? Uh, something called existentialism. Okay, existentialism. This is a response to nihilism's rejection of meaning. Okay, so what you have is a nihilist that goes, I can't live like this. It, it is untenable, they might say. And so what can I do? I don't believe in God. What can, what can I do to find meaning in life? Well, existentialism has an answer for that, okay? Existentialism is a focusing on the subjective in order to find freedom and meaning as a human race, okay? You catch that? They don't look to the objective world to find meaning. They agree. There's no meaning there. So we have to move to the subjective, the inner part. Um, you know, for instance, uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's not a subjective truth. That is an objective truth, okay? But um, the way a song on the radio affects me, the way it makes me feel, the way I, uh, that I feel as a result of listening to it. That's a subjective quality that I'm describing there. And so that's where meaning is found. Let's look at some characteristics of existentialism. Uh, there are two distinct realities, as we just said, the objective and the subjective. Existentialism focuses on the subjective, obviously, when we're talking about meaning. Uh, science and logic are part of which of those two worlds do you think? Objective. That's where science and logic exist, not in the object. That's the objective world. Okay, and that's okay, that's there, that's real, but that's not where you find meaning. Existentialism focuses rather on the subjective, as we said. Um, there's no meaning to be found in the objective world. So uh, we're looking to significant, to finding, we're looking for significance and meaning in what we've called and described as the subjective world, a world in, of which each individual has control. See, that's the, that's the beauty of existentialism for someone who doesn't believe in a God and still trying to find uh, meaning is that they create meaning for themselves. They're in charge of defining what's meaningful and establishing significance for their own lives. That's found in the subjective. And so that's what existentialism is all about. It's an atheistic uh, worldview that is built off naturalism and, uh, and, and maybe even concludes like nihilism that, that there's really no meaning in the world as a result and finds meaning not in the objective world, but rather in the subjective world. We need the objective world. I mean, that's where all facts and all these sorts of things exist, but not meaning and significance. We have to look to the subjective for that. That's existentialism. Let me just uh, give you just a little sidebar here. There's a thing called theistic existentialism. Okay, Theistic existentialism assumes a theistic foundation. It's not atheistic, as the name would imply, okay? But uh, there's not a genetic connection between existentialism and theistic existentialism. Uh, one doesn't come from the other, but they're just related thematically because of theistic existentialism's focus on the subjective. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Uh, there are certain uh, figures associated with this, uh, Soren Kierkegaard or Karl Barth and some of these figures that have been uh, Christian figures in the history of Christianity that have held to theistic existentialism. They answer questions about uh, the historical objective facts regarding Christianity by appealing to the subjective. Okay? In, other words, in other words, whether the resurrection, for example, is historically true is not really of concern to a theistic existentialist. The resurrection is religiously true. In other words, it has subjective meaning to the individual. Okay? Do you see the difference? You know, there's a lot of people that uh, have careers in Christianity writing about the historical reality of the resurrection, which, by the way, I applaud them for because I think that's very important. But to a theistic existentialist, that's not even an important question, whether that's historically true or not, because it has subjective meaning to me, and that's where meaning is found. So that's a little sidebar for you just to expose you to that particular worldview as well. Now, there's other worldviews I could talk about, uh, Eastern pantheistic monism, New Age spirituality, and so on. Uh, but for the sake of time, because you guys have a lot of material to cover, I'm just going to talk about one further worldview, and that's the postmodern worldview, postmodernism, okay? We've talked about this a little bit, and postmodernism is uh, basically a rejection of, uh, of the objective, okay? We've been talking all this time about the importance, you know, in naturalism and other things, about that objective world, okay? But in post-modernity, uh, objective, uh, the objective world as it regards morality and truth is, is, 
is shunned, okay? And so, uh, so when we talk about the importance of objectivity and naturalism and so forth, we're not talking about morality or ethics or anything like this. Uh, these are creations, uh, these are human creations. And so postmodernity uh, picks up on that, and it's an emphasis on, on uh, sort of the illusion of objective morality, okay? You hear people talking about, uh, uh, maybe you're discussing a particular issue and you disagree. <clears throat> it's very common to say, or to sort of, sort of conclude that, well, that's, that's a good truth for you. That's your truth. And my particular view, which is different than your view, even though they might be contradictory, that's okay. That's my truth. And, uh, and then all is great, and you can have coffee, and that's fine. But this is kind of a post-modernistic worldview that's in operation here. And uh, the question is, is that, is that really possible? Okay. Well, it's not consistent, at least, with, theistic, uh, with the theistic worldview. Okay. That's not really uh, consistent with that. There are Christians who try to reconcile post-modernity -mo post with Christian theism. And I just simply think that they're uh, not very successful at doing so, though I applaud their, uh, their concern about wanting to communicate Christianity to, Christianity to folks that have a postmodern mindset. But I'm just not sure that it's consistent, and as a result, I'm not sure that we're able to uh, reconcile those two things. In fact, I'm convinced that we cannot. But anyway, having said that, let me just read you a quote from Nietzsche. I've already mentioned his name. Nietzsche, the, uh, the famous... Uh, philosopher, right? He actually predated the postmodern era, uh, postmodernity sort of beginning as a sort of a era in, in the history and the thought of mankind in around 1950. That's when this started becoming uh, a particular thought that was discernible uh, starting around 1950. Uh, Nietzsche preceded this time. He was in the modern era. However, his thoughts, uh, we generally kind of consider him to be the grandfather of postmodernity because his thoughts sort of naturally led and sort of laid and paved the way for uh, future postmodern thinkers. Let me just read you a quote that he, uh, that he has made. Nietzsche says, What then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms. In short, some, a sum of human relations, which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which after long use see firm, canonical, obligatory, to people, to a people that seems that way to them. Truths are illusions, he says. Truths are illusions about which one has forgotten, that is, what they are. Metaphors, which are worn out and without sensuous power. Coins, which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. We still do not know where the urge for truth comes from. For as yet we have heard only of the obligation imposed by society that it should exist. To be truthful means using the customary metaphors. In normal terms, the obligation to lie according to fixed convention. To lie herd-like in a style obligatory for all. Well, as you can see, Nietzsche didn't have a lot of, uh, didn't have a lot of esteem for the idea of moral, uh, objective morality. He basically just said that truth was something that we've made up. Right? It doesn't exist in an objective sense. It's not true whether we believe it or not. You know, if something is objectively true, it's true whether I believe it or not. Well, uh, truth for Nietzsche uh, is not true because, uh, regardless of what I believe, truth is something that is invented. It's an illusion. And so this is some, something that's consistent with what we call post, the postmodern worldview. Okay, well, guys, this is all we have time for for now. I hope these, uh, lectures on, these two lectures on worldview have been helpful. Next week, we'll move into some lectures on theology. You'll be doing your worldview reading. Hopefully these lectures will inform you as you do that. And uh, you'll also have an assignment, as I mentioned, on the Statement of Faith for Letourneau. That opens up the topic of theology. We'll have some lectures that go along and complement that assignment. We'll see you guys then.